Next we're going to look at, now that we know what spontaneity means, thermodynamically favorable means, we're going to look at the energy changes that occur in those spontaneous reactions, in those thermodynamically favorable reactions. Most thermodynamically favorable reactions are exothermic. They have negative delta H values. If you think about it from the perspective of the universe, uh, an endothermic reaction would require the universe to give the reaction some of its energy in order for it to go. And how is that kind of a win for the universe? We're going to see that soon. There's a reason why endothermic reactions happen at all. Um, but most thermodynamically favorable reactions are exothermic. They release energy to the surroundings. They don't take energy from the surroundings. If you think about an ice cube at various temperatures, let's think about an ice cube at room temperature. The melting of ice would be spontaneous, but in order to melt ice, you have to put energy into the ice cube. You have to break the intermolecular forces in the ice cube. That's you're putting energy in, an endothermic process. But it's still thermodynamically favorable. It's sp still spontaneous, even though you're putting energy in. If we flip those temperatures and we keep that ice cube in an extremely cold environment, the melting of ice is not going to be spontaneous. It won't happen all on its own. So temperature has something to do with spontaneity, whether or not a reaction will proceed in a certain direction all by itself. But we can't say that a reaction has to be exothermic to be spontaneous. If I bring you back to your physics days there for just a minute, you guys know that an energy in a system must be conserved, right? You, can, you can't create energy, you can't destroy energy, it, it can just switch forms, but it's always conserved. So picture taking your AP Chemistry textbook and holding that book high up in the air above your head. If we asked you what kind of energy that book would possess as it hold, as being held over your head, that would be potential energy, right? MGH. Now let's picture letting that textbook go and it starts to fall to the floor. As it's falling, it has some potential energy, but the height as it's falling is getting smaller. So the MGH value is getting smaller overall compared to when it was above your head. So where's that energy going? It's being converted into kinetic energy, right? One half mv squared. So the velocity of your book is suddenly um, much greater as it's falling. So you get that trade-off for potential turning into kinetic. And then as it hits the floor, the h value is zero. So you have no more potential and it's all kinetic as it hits the floor. The book falling to the floor is spontaneous, right? When you let go, the book doesn't float up into the air. The book falls straight down. So one reason that happens is because of gravity. But what does it have to do with the things that we're thinking about now? Why does the book fall to the floor for other reasons other than gravity? One reason is the entropy. In that textbook example, the energy in the book and the matter around it went from being more concentrated to more dispersed. That the energy was in one location, all potential, as it was above your head. And then as it hits the ground, that energy is more dispersed. Uh, it'll make probably a loud bang. It turns into sound energy and things like that, right? Um, so it used to be concentrated and then it spreads out. When you hear that term entropy, which they use the letter S as a variable to represent en energy, energy is a measurement of the dispersal of energy and matter. It measures how disordered things are. The second law of thermodynamics states that thermodynamically favorable reactions result in an increase of the entropy of the universe. In other words, if the reaction overall causes things to become more disordered, then that reaction is going to be spontaneous in that particular reaction. So holding a book above your head and letting go 
the book is going to fall to the floor all on its own, yes because of gravity, but also because when you let go and it, the book starts to fall and it hits the ground and there's this big bang of sound, that energy has been dispersed, a uh, more chaotic situation. Positive delta S. So if you picture your desk at home, maybe at the beginning of the week, it looks like the picture on the left. But by the end of the week, maybe it looks more like the picture on the right. That on its own, things get messy all by themselves, right? That your desk doesn't stay looking like the picture on the left unless you put work in to clean up your desk every day. If you just let the reaction do its thing all by itself without helping put things back into order, your desk is going to look more like the picture on the right. Maybe some of you are thinking it looks like the picture on the right all the time, right? But it didn't start that way when your desk first got put into your bedroom it did look more like the picture on the left. So if your parents complain that your room is messy, you can just tell them, sorry, there, it's just an example of entropy. There's nothing I can do. Exothermic reactions and entropy. If you picture, look at that picture on the right there, it kind of looks like a firework exploding, right? Your energy is dispersed in exothermic reactions because energy is released to a greater number of particles in the surroundings. So if you have a, even something as simple as a candle that's being lit and it's releasing some of that heat energy right by the wick there, it's causing the air particles around that little flame to be warmed up, move more quickly, and disperse throughout the room. What about the dispersal of matter and entropy? Matter is dispersed if it has a larger number of arrangements called microstates uh, to it. Think of bedhead. So I've got this picture here of this little kid who just woke up from a nap. The greater number of arrangements of microstates, the more probable that that state is. It's more likely that when you go to bed, when you wake up the next morning that your hair looks like this kid's, then for you to go to sleep, wake up the next day, and your hair is all perfectly in place, right? That's entropy again. The state of disorder is more likely. It's going to happen. You're going to get that bedhead more than a perfect uh, hairdo, right? So which of these guys would have that higher entropy, that greater state of disorder? So if we had a solid at 50 degrees versus the same exact solid at 20 degrees, the solid at 50 degrees would have higher entropy, more disorder, more chaos, because those particles are moving more quickly. Generally speaking, if you were to compare solids versus liquids versus gases, those gases are going to have higher entropies. The particles are moving around more chaotically. If you have mixtures versus pure substances, those mixtures are a little bit more chaotic and crazy. If you have a small molecule versus a large molecule, so methane, CH4, versus octane, C8H18, um, those pictures that you see off to the right there, when you take organic chemistry in college, you'll learn about how those molecules can bend and flex. Well, if you have a larger molecule, there's more ways for it to twist or rotate or vibrate than if the molecule is smaller. So larger molecules tend to be more disordered, higher entropy. And then ionic substances, uh, if you had like NaF versus MgO, and we said which one of those guys would have your higher entropy, it's probably gonna be your sodium fluoride because with its plus one minus one, ions there, as opposed to the magnesium oxides plus two minus two, the plus one minus one, the attractive forces aren't as strong between them, and so it's going to be a little bit less organized. Now, I would love to be able to do this fun activity of entropy with you virtually. Unfortunately, that's not going to happen, but if you just want to read the procedure and this next slide here, that'll, unfortunately, would have been something we could have done if we were together.